Today is June 20th, 2023, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. In this talk, I'd like to help students make their way through Chapter 1 of Book 1 in Classical Arithmetic. What I'll do is walk through the text and uh, explain anything that I think might give students some trouble and then try to make some helpful applications to uh, help students appreciate these studies and think about how they might make use of them uh, in, the, in the rest of their studies as they continue in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. So this is chapter one of book one of Nicomachus's Introduction to Arithmetic. We read the ancients, the ancient philosophers, that is, who under the leadership of Pythagoras first made science systematic. Those ancients defined philosophy as the love of wisdom. That's what the word uh, literally means, the Greek word. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Indeed, the name itself means this. The name itself, philosophy, means the love of wisdom. And before Pythagoras, all who had knowledge were called wise indiscriminately. Any kind of knowledge, anyone skilled in any area, was called wise. So we can, we can say that the word wise really meant skilled or knowledgeable, maybe expert. And that was how the word wise was used before the time of Pythagoras. A carpenter, for example, a cobbler, a helmsman, and in a word, anyone who was versed in any art or handicraft was called a wise man. Again, that was how the word wise was used before Pythagoras. Pythagoras, however, restricting the title, restricting the use of the name wise, so as to apply to the knowledge and comprehension of reality, and this is an important term, reality. Let me read that again. Pythagoras restricting the title of wise so as to apply to the knowledge and comprehension of reality, and calling the knowledge of the truth in this the only wisdom, naturally designated the desire and pursuit of this knowledge to be philosophy, as being the desire for wisdom. So Pythagoras made a distinction and said, no, 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 wisdom is not skill or knowledge in any area, whatever, because men can be knowledgeable of trivial things, of nonsense. Men can memorize all of the characters in cartoons, and no one would rightly call this wisdom. So Pythagoras restricted the use of this term to those who pursue the knowledge of what he calls reality, and we're going to learn more about that in a little bit. So we see Pythagoras is recognized by Nicomachus as sort of the turning point in history where the idea of philosophy and of wisdom really has its beginning. So let's continue with the reading. He, that is Pythagoras, is more worthy of credence or faith he is more worthy of credence than those who have given other definitions since he makes clear sense of the term and the thing defined. This is an important point that uh, we don't think too much about today. If you have a good dictionary and look up a word in the dictionary, you know that there's always uh, a information on the etymology or origin of the word. And we might wonder why they do that. And the reason why is because it's understood that the meaning of the word 
is present in the word itself. The word has a history. The word is composed of parts. Those parts themselves have meanings, and the composition of the word usually has some relation to the parts of it. Now, that's not always true, as Aristotle points out, but it's, it's usually true, especially when a word is composite and it's made up of parts that do have their own meanings. Meanings, sorry. Um, for example, if we take a word like uh, subcutaneous, subcutaneous, and we know that cutaneous refers to the skin, and sub is a preposition that means under. Well, subcutaneous, we can, we can understand, means under the skin. So we can see that when we're not sure what a word means, especially a word that was used in history, and there's a number of explanations of what the word means, we learn a principle here that whoever can give the meaning of the word that actually makes sense of the word itself, that's the explanation that we should be most ready to receive. And if you study the ancient philosophers, you'll, you'll learn that they often do this. They often spend time uh, trying to explain ideas and terms by looking into the etymology or the origins of the words. So that's an important principle for us to learn here and remember. If there's going to be uh, a good explanation of the meaning of the word, that meaning will likely explain not only the idea signified by the word, but the word itself. So that's a good, a good point that Nicomachus makes, and that's why our dictionaries have etymology included for the words that are listed. So he says, Pythagoras is more worthy of credence than those who have given other definitions, since he makes clear the sense of the term and the thing defined. This wisdom he defined as the knowledge or science. And remember that science, when we're reading ancient philosophers, uh, doesn't mean what we mean by the term today in modern science. Science means systematic knowledge systematic knowledge of a subject that's established by philosophical investigation. So Pythagoras defined wisdom as the knowledge or science of the truth in real things. And here again we have this idea of reality in, in the teaching of Pythagoras. What does it mean to be real? We're going to learn that in just a minute. He defined wisdom as the knowledge or science of the truth in real things, conceiving science to be a steadfast and firm apprehension of the underlying substance, that is, what the thing really is in its substance or essence. Remember, substance and essence are words that are used interchangeably in English translations of philosophy. So this term science refers to the steadfast and firm apprehension of the underlying substance of a thing. And real things, here's where we learn what these real things are, real things are those which continue uniformly and the same in the universe, and never depart, even briefly, from their existence. Let me repeat that. Real things, according to Pythagoras, are those things which continue uniformly and the same in the universe, and never depart, even briefly, from their existence. These real things would be things immaterial, not material things, by sharing in the substance of which everything else that exists under the same name and is so called is said to be this particular thing and exists. So we have here Pythagoras' idea 
of real things. Real things are those which exist always without ever departing from their essence. They're things that do not change. Things immaterial, because matter is constantly undergoing change. So the real things, according to Pythagoras, can't be material, because then they would always be changing. These real things, he says, would be things immaterial by sharing in the substance of which everything else that exists under the same name and is so-called is said to be this particular thing and exists. He then goes on to explain this more clearly. He says, for bodily material things are, to be sure, forever involved in continuous flow and change. Material things, or bodies, are forever involved in continuous flow and change, and therefore they're not real things. Material things are forever involved in continuous flow and change in imitation of the nature of and peculiar quality of that eternal matter and substance which has been from the beginning and which was all changeable and variable throughout. So it's interesting to see that for Pythagoras, material things are things that imitate the nature and quality of eternal matter. Material things are constantly changing, and yet in some ways they imitate the nature and quality of eternal matter, eternal substance, which has been from the beginning. He says, bodiless things, however, bodiless, immaterial things, however, of which we conceive in connection with or together with matter, such as qualities, quantities, configurations, largeness, smallness, equality, relations, actualities, dispositions, places, times, all those things, in a word, whereby the qualities found in each body are comprehended, all these are of themselves immovable and unchangeable. But accidentally, they share in and partake of the affections of the body to which they belong. Now, that was a lot to, to listen to, and I'm sorry that sentence is very long, and I wanted to read through the whole sentence to get the whole idea. But what Pythagoras distinguishes here are things that actually exist in themselves, which we call substances, and all of the other things which only exist in substances. That is, they themselves have no body, no material. They exist in primary substances. And he gives us a list of examples of these things. These are the eternal things that he's talking about. These are the real things. Qualities, quantities, configurations, largeness, smallness, equality, relations, actualities, dispositions, places, and times. Now, as I read through that list, if you've done some philosophy study, you should feel that that sounds familiar. Listen again. Qualities, quantities, configurations, largeness, smallness, equality, relations, actualities, dispositions, places, times. Where have we heard these ideas before? These sound like Aristotle's categories. So you can see that this idea that Aristotle would later explain in a systematic or scientific way in the categories, this idea was already being promoted by Pythagoras earlier than Aristotle. 
So we have this we have this understanding of the distinction between primary substances and the other attributes, the other nine of Aristotle's ten categories, and and we see a list here from Pythagorean teaching which resembles very closely the kinds of ideas that Aristotle listed in the ten categories. So we can see what Pythagoras is getting at here. He's saying that the bodies, the material things, the primary substances that exist, the kind of things that are studied by modern experimental science, they're not real things. They're not the real things. They are constantly coming and going. They, they're born, they die, they change. They're not real things. And that's not the kind of stuff that wise men seek to comprehend. Wise men seek to comprehend those things which do not change. Now, sometimes when we say something like that, we say reality is that which does not change. Often Christians oversimplify this and say, oh, he, he means God. He means God because God is eternal. That, that's really not what he means here. He's talking about ideas. Ideas that a philosopher can seek through reasoning. Ideas that never change. Once we understand them, that understanding never changes. The knowledge never changes. The existence of those ideas never changes. And the idea here has to do with investment. If we're going to invest, we normally look to invest, and, and I don't mean financial necessarily, I, I mean any kind of investment, investment of our energy, of our time, of our attention, and so on. When we consider whether we should invest in something, one of the things we consider is whether it's going to last. Whether it's going to last. Children love to build sandcastles, for example. They'll spend an hour working on a sandcastle, knowing that at any moment a wave is going to come up on shore and wash it away. And the kids will beg their parents and say, come on, Daddy, come, come make a sandcastle with me. And the father thinks there's nothing that's a greater waste of his time and energy than building a sandcastle. Why would I invest my time and energy in something that I know is going to be changed and destroyed? almost as soon as it comes into existence. A wise man wouldn't seek something whose existence he knows is going to be short-lived. And so a wise man wants to invest his time and energy and attention in something that once he obtains it will never be taken from him. He'll be able to enjoy it forever. And these things are not material things. And the wise man understands that. The wise man understands that things which we can possess and keep forever are not material things, but immaterial things. And these immaterial things exist in our own minds. They're our own ideas and thoughts, our own knowledge. And these, these qualities and quantities and other attributes that he lists the essence of these things, the nature of these things, are things that can be understood and retained forever, whereas the knowledge of a specific individual material thing is limited by the existence of that thing itself, which comes into existence and goes away. And being an individual, that knowledge doesn't necessarily help you to understand anything else because it was limited to that individual thing. This is why modern science for an ancient philosopher would be ridiculous. All of this money, all of this time, all of this effort put into researching individual material things? For what purpose? To gain knowledge of individual things? Or we can say, oh no, the knowledge of individual things helps us to understand entire classes of things. An ancient philosopher would say, that's not true. That's not true. The study of individual things, unless you can study every single individual thing that exists, never gives you any certainty of knowledge of all things. 
the most it can do is identify a probability, perhaps, but the study of individual things, of primary substances, is not what a wise man desires. And so we see the difference here between ancient philosophy, where men sought to understand universal truths that are not temporary, but endure forever. And they really despised the knowledge of material things, the knowledge of particular things, of individual bodily things. They considered that knowledge to be rather useless, and I would argue that the ancients judged wisely. So this is what is explained here in this first chapter by Nicomachus, speaking and summarizing uh, Pythagorean teaching on real things. He says, these are the things, these real things, these unchanging, eternal things are the things that a wise man seeks to know. And then he concludes chapter 1 by saying, Now, it is with such things that wisdom is particularly concerned, but accidentally also with things that share in them, that is, bodies. So we do have some interest in bodies or material things, but only an accidental interest. Our real interest is with those things with which wisdom is particularly concerned, namely those immaterial things that do not change, that do not um, increase, uh, I shouldn't say increase or diminish, the things that do not change, things that do not come into existence and pass away. So that's all for chapter one here. We see it's just a general introduction to philosophy itself. We're talking about the meaning of the word wisdom and of the word philosophy. And we get into this discussion of real things because it's included in Pythagoras's definition of wisdom. He defined wisdom as the science of truth in real things. And then in this chapter, we see that the word science is explained to us and the term real things is explained to us so we can understand the definition of wisdom. So if I was going to summarize chapter 1, I would say that in chapter 1, Nicomachus introduces us to the Pythagorean idea of wisdom. So if you're a student in the Academy's classical arithmetic course, I, I hope that that's a helpful pre-lection or introduction to the, to the lesson. What you need to do now is study this lesson on your own for mastery. Study the lesson, uh, work to make sure you understand every, every word, every phrase, every sentence you read in the lesson, and complete the lesson assessment and submit it for review and grading. Um, this lecture, again, was intended just as an introduction or pre-lection to the lesson, and uh, as you study and work to complete the assessment, if there's anything you come upon in this lesson that you don't understand or would like some explanation for, just post your questions on the student forum on the course page in Classical Arithmetic. I hope that's a helpful walk through the lesson. If you have any questions, get in touch. God bless your studies.